Good evening, everybody. I am Apostle T.B. Walker, and I certainly want to welcome you to our Bible study tonight. We are, uh, I am the pastor of Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we are reaching the world one share at a time. So glad to have you here with us. Uh, we're going to go interactive tonight, so I'm hoping that uh, those of you that may have read our post, if not, I'll go over it with you briefly. We want to have, I want to have taken an opportunity to really be able to connect with you in a, in a different way uh, in our Bible study. So if there's some comments that you have, please bless us and those that are, that are on with us with your comments, things that you're thinking about uh, what you heard. And maybe there's some additional revelation that you might be able to bring to the table that will be a blessing to everybody in the group. But if there are any questions that you have, uh, I hope that you don't feel uncomfortable writing those also in the comments. We're going to we'll have someone who's going to be taking those down. They're going to be reading those back to me. And I want to be able to take some time during our Bible study to answer some of those questions. We are a global ministry. And so part of our, uh, our mandate is to make sure that uh, believers that are under are in our sphere of influence and under the sound of my voice and teaching that you are an educated believer. And if there are any questions that you have, the scripture says, listen, you know, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will give it to you liberally and upbraid if not. And one of the ways that God gives us wisdom is through the teaching of pastors. He says, I'll give you pastors after my own heart who will teach you, who will feed you with wisdom and knowledge. So that's really the purpose of what we're doing now with our Bible study, uh, trying to make sure that we're as interactive as possible because we do want to reach the world. Uh, so I'm going to be reading tonight out of the book of Matthew, chapter number 23, starting at verse number one and ending verse number 10. I'm going to read that in your hearing. The plan tonight, though, is not to complete all of this. There's so much there. We probably won't get to all of it, uh, but we will get to a part of it. We'll get to part one and then next week we'll do part two. Now, one of the things that I want to get to in part number one is that you have a responsibility here. You know, as, as a part of the ministry and for people who are connected to this ministry, one of the things that I need you to do is to help me to reach our goal uh, or, to, or the mandate, the charge that we have, which is to reach the world one share at a time. If this Bible study is a blessing to you, if you receive a revelation from it and you are on the revelation train, so you will, if you receive revelation, we're going to ask that you just hit that share button, that you share the video, that you make sure that as many people as possible can hear what you're hearing, see what you're seeing and feel what you're feeling through this connection with Christ through the teaching of his word. And once again, I'm going to be reading out the book of Matthew chapter number 23, starting at verse number one through 10. We're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to get directly into the word of God. Once again, so glad to have each and every one of you all that are here that are with us. Share the video, tell your friends that we're on and, and invite them to come on. Don't even don't hesitate to even start a watch party because we want to make sure that people hear the word of God. I'm going to read this in your hearing coming from the ESV version. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. Do whatever they tell you, but not the works they do for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens and hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their felicitaries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue. A couple words in there that um, we'll define a little bit later. And they, they like the greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers and call no man your father on earth. For you have one father who is in heaven, neither be called instructors for you have one instructor that is Christ. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you right now for this, this interaction that we're having this night uh, through your word online. God, we just thank you right now that we know that, we're, that you're in the midst because you promised where two or three are gathered together in your name that you'd be right there in the middle of it. So God, we just thank you that we know that you're here, that we know that your spirit is permeating every atmosphere, and that God, that you've gathered us together to sit at your feet and to get that great good part that cannot be taken away. So God, we just thank you right now for all that you're doing, what you're going to continue to do in your word in Jesus name. Amen. Now let's dive into the scripture. Now let's look at how, let's look at Matthew 22 and let's see how Matthew 22 ends because the whole of Matthew 22 is really just the scribes and the Pharisees trying to find some way to uh, trip Jesus up. 
the try that you know throughout this whole time we find them tempting him and testing him and at the very end of it we find out that the gap that the pharisees had gathered together the sadducees were there scribes were there jesus has silenced every single group with his words and now because he's now really at the end of his ministry so now we have at the very end of this in, in chapter 22, verse 41, it says, uh, now while the Pharisees were gathered th together, Jesus now asked them a question. He kind of flips the script. He's about to put the kibosh on the whole thing. And he says, well, now, who, you know, tell me what you think about the Christ. Whose son is he? And they said, well, obviously the Christ is the son of David. Jesus says, well, how is it then that David by the spirit said, Lord said to my Lord, right? That's what he says. Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So David is calling someone Lord here. And he's talking about the Messiah. So he says, then if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? There is a theological mystery here that Jesus is now dealing with. He's not trying to be deep. He's just uh, allowing the Pharisees to recognize that they are not deep. You know, that, that the truth of the matter is the basics of this doctrine uh, has an understanding that the Messiah has to be, if they understood the scripture, that he clearly is greater than David and yet from the lineage of David. So their understanding of this is thrown off. But at the end of this, it says, and no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. So it's over. He has shut it down now. So now he's teaching. He's now talking to his disciples. And it says, now Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, he's now speaking to the crowds. The, the, the disciples have slunk away. And I mean, I'm assuming slunk is the past tense version of slink. So um, I'm a, they were they they had slunk away. They were slinking away, or however you see it, they they were they were not there, or they had had their heads uh, uh, laid in shame based upon what Jesus now has done. Scripture says from that point on they didn't dare. It doesn't say that that from that point on they don't have any more questions that they could ask. They don't dare because every time they tried to front him, he fronted them. Every time they tried to stump him, he stumped them. Every trick, plot, plan that they put together so that he would fall in the hole, they looked up and found themselves in need of a ladder, somebody needing to pull them out. So when you begin to look at this, he's now speaking to the common people. He's also speaking to his disciples. Now, not just the 12, but these are all those that are called by his name, all that are following him at this spot. Now, Jesus now is talking about the scribes and about the Pharisees, but the truth of the matter is he's pretty much done talking to the Pharisees and to the scribes and to the Sadducees. So instead of talking to them and, and, and he's now talking about them, he's now warning uh, his disciples and to the followers concerning them. Right. The, the true target of this message that he's speaking to the crowd is really a warning to them that they are going to need to break free of the legalism that's found in the doctrine of the Pharisees. Right. So the reality is that Jesus knows here that there's a need that, that the idea that there are some moments where, you know, I'm quicker than them. And he realized that there's moments where, you know, in the marketplace, I had an answer that you didn't have. So being able to stump them is momentary. But he realizes how deep tradition is in people, how steeped people can get in tradition. Matter of fact, people can be so wrapped up in tradition that they'll actually fight freedom, that people can get so wrapped up in tradition that they won't recognize liberty, even if it comes from God. So when you begin to look at this, that Jesus now recognize exactly what can happen. Listen, you know what? When you understand how deep this can be, you've got to really look at like the Stockholm syndrome, where you can have someone who has been captured and then indoctrinated and, and, and finally fed. And, and so after a point, uh, the, the person who has been captured actually now begins to side with their captors. You know, I mean, Patty Hearst was one of the greatest ones that we can see in our, you know, in, in, in secular history, who, you know, who was, who was supposedly captured, uh, kidnapped, taken out of her normal world, but then indoctrinated. And of course, 
feet being fed, being taken care of, being indoctrinated, being fed, being taken care of, being indoctrinated. So at some point, she ends up with a gun in her hand, robbing a bank with the very people who had committed the crime of kidnapping with her. So the, the idea here is that there are captives sometimes that will not run th from their captors after years of captivity. And tradition can operate in that very same way. Why? Because sometimes what will happen with tradition is that tradition over time gets validated by people that we respect, by people that we love, by people that we trust. So the reality is that Jesus knows that if they don't get free from this legalism, if they don't get free from the traditions of men, if they don't get free from human religion, then they are running the risk of doing this not only being in bondage themselves, but taking on the gospel and infusing it with legalism, taking on the gospel, the good news, adding and reproducing this captor, captive mindset, this traditional mindset that literally makes the laws of God of none effect to such an extent that they'll be preaching a gospel that ceases to be a gospel. The gospel, the word means good news. That when you add legalism, when you add human rules, it no longer is good news. It's packaged as good news. So it, it, it's talked about and spoken of as good news, but it absolutely has no nothing good in it. And it gets so tough sometimes that what you find is People who are bound and burdened by this very same tradition simply are not aware that freedom even exists. They have no idea outside because one of the things that happens is that when you get this, you begin to move into isolation. And, and you know, isolation makes you think that there's nothing else outside of that but you. You won't see free people. You won't see people that are in liberty. You won't see people that are, aren't operating in legalism. You won't see what it looks like to operate in the spirit versus to operate in the, in the spirit of tradition. So without being in fellowship, be, being isolated in your little group, in your little movement, it, it keeps you from being able to see the other things that God has in store that he's placed around us in other people. So when you begin to look at this, Jesus up to this point has not gone public. Jesus has now up to this point has now den has not denounced the Pharisees in a public way. This has been in some cases face to face. We know that in some cases it's been in some small groups, but now Jesus is going public. He is now warning his people openly about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's warning them and he's denouncing them in a public way. You know that this is going to be a problem. Now, he not only reproves the hypocrisy that you find in the Pharisees, but he reproves the traditions, the way that they operate in front of the multitudes, right? So there is in some ways some unperverted conscience left in the people. There is, there, there's some places, if Jesus is ministering, there are still areas of hope that are still there. He would never, as he has turned his back on the Pharisees and, and recognize there's, there's, I'm not speaking here with hope because I recognize the ground that I'm, I'm dealing with. That when he was in his own hometown and he realized in Capernaum, he says, I can do no miracles here. So he left that place. Jesus is still there talking to them because there is an unperverted conscience yet still there. That the work of the enemy, the work of tradition, the work of human people who really feel like they're doing God's work has not completely taken over the people yet. So Jesus closes this his ministry by teaching the people, or should I say, warning the people through his teaching about human wisdom. Listen, human wisdom, what, what are we talking about? Well, a way that seems right unto man. Listen, when you understand that scripture, you don't, sometimes we don't understand the real danger in that scripture. Because listen, I did it because it seemed right. So when you understand a way that seems right unto a man, we know that right after something seems right, there is an action that happens that corresponds to that, that has absolutely no tinge of conviction connected to it. When it seems like it's right to do, that, that means that it's also in my mind absent of any opposing thought. There is 
absolutely no opposition. Listen, when I think I'm right, when I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost says, I'll reprove the world of sin. In other words, not only going to expose sin in the world, but the Holy Ghost will lead me to all truth. In other words, when he leads me to truth, I may find out that the path that I'm walking in was not true. Christ leading me in truth may be go that way. I, can, I know I was about to go that way. So he doesn't even have to always say the way you're going is wrong. He simply says the way, this is the way and walk ye in it. So the reality is when I don't have that, it actually feels right to persecute the believers. So the Pharisees actually felt right. Now, let me give you just a little history of the Pharisees so we can understand who they are. Pharisees have been around probably 200 years before Jesus had come about. Um, you know, there's an intertestamental period uh, uh, between Malachi and Matthew. Uh, and, and listen, if anybody has any questions, again, do not hesitate to, to write your questions down because I want to take some time to answer those. Uh, but I want to give you a history of the Pharisees, just a, a brief history. Uh, you know, in that intertestamental period, that period between Malachi and Matthew, where the Bible says that the word of the Lord was scarce in those days, it was precious in some scripture, in some transcripts, it says the word was precious. It was rare in those days that the Lord, it appeared, had not been speaking in the broadness as he had spoken in the, in, in the other areas in the Old Testament. And we, we see great prophets that had gone forth, but now we see there's a trickling of the word that, that, that obviously God has never stopped speaking, but he was not speaking in the in the way that he had spoken before so what we have in between that period is jewish history and in that jewish history we have the maccabeus family and uh, judas maccabeus has the the children of israel have been under constant attack by the syrians by the egyptians by many other countries that were surrounding them they had uh had victory there and began to form a priestly dynasty under under J judas maccabeus's nephew john harkinus and they had started now a priestly uh monarchy and what that did was the moment they started that and it, and it seemed right, uh, a priestly monarchy. And, and what they did by doing that, it moved the priests out of just simply a spiritual realm, but it moved them into a spiritual slash political realm. And so around that group, we have elders, we have rabbis, we have sages, and they were like the Congress. So they, they formed the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the, 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 and out of that group comes the Pharisees. Uh, and, and the Pharisees are called separate ones. Now, the Pharisees, being separate ones, became a separate party unto themselves. The separate ones were ones who separated themselves from Gentiles. They separated themselves from anything that was unclean. They separated themselves from Jews who were not even observant. They were watching and they recognized that the, the priesthood had become secular that the government had become secular and that, that so they chose they put themselves in a position as people who were keepers of the law they were going to be an example to the people if we understand uh, what the pharisees were really all about you just have to look at fundamentalist christians today you know i mean it, it, there's so much of it feels right if you look at the middle east and you see what sharia law uh, even in, with the Muslims and many of uh, those that are in ISIS and ISIL were, were trying to start a caliphate, a religious monarchy where there's a monarchy that's run by priests. So the priests become spiritual and absolutely political at the very same time. The law becomes the law of Sharia, a law that supposedly comes from God that governs daily life. So when you understand how the Pharisees come about, they come about as separate ones. They're, their design was to bring people back to God. But over time, they begin to become a legal party themselves. Without trying, they become a, a legal a party themselves. Like non-denominational churches, very much in the same way, have decided not to be denominational, but over a period of 20 years or so, have become a denomination, whether they were trying to become a denomination or not. The Pharisees, as they begin to now with their zeal for the Lord, but without their knowledge of the spirit of the Lord, they begin to observe the letter of the law without understanding the spirit of the law. So they begin to put lay 
heavy burdens upon the people. And over a period of time, people had their back. People really began to like them. They looked at them and thought, man, I would love to be like that. You know, I don't live quite like that, but the Pharisees are a great example. Man, I would love to be in a position that they're in. Look at how they're devoted to God. Matter of fact, look at how they treat every law. People looked at themselves and knew that they weren't keeping the laws, but look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees looked like they had it all together, and the fact that the Pharisees openly shunned anything that was not like them. The Pharisees were the ones who, you know, had religion in a way that many people look and say, wow, they really are religious because look, she's got that on her head. Look, they don't do any dancing. They don't listen to any kind of music. Wow, they don't even have a tambourine in their church. So man, I mean, th th look at the Amish and they're in a situation where they're so separate from the world. Man, look at how this is really great. This gives them an opportunity to really, really worship God in a perfect way. But over time, they moved away from the Lord. They moved away from the law and began to add the tradition of the elders as equal to the law. And eventually they begin to even have it supersede the very law of Moses. So Jesus now comes and says, now I want you to look at this. He says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, right? So Jesus said that, that there's respect that's due to the Pharisees because of the position that they have. Not because of their conduct, but because they sit on Moses' seat, right? They have the authority to the, hold this office that's literally been given to them, right? That's been given to them by the priesthood and, and this seat uh, it, even given to them by God. Now, this is not the reality here is that this is not saying that the law of God loses authority because of the people that's there. Listen, when the Lord says honor, when the Lord says give respect to whom respect is due, there are people who literally are in positions where their, uh, their conduct says, I have no respect for you whatsoever. But the Lord says, no, 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 you give honor where honor's due. The law, it's not supposed to, it's supposed to affect them, but don't let it affect you. You know, when you've got someone, if, if, Donald Trump walked in and you were not a Republican, it would still be a respectful thing to say, Mr. President, because he is the president. And the reality is that the Lord says, and they don't carry the sword in vain. They're not in their position in vain. So when you begin to look at this, Jesus says they are sitting in Moses' seat. Now, what does this have to do with Moses? I want you to look at Deuteronomy. Uh, well, Exodus chapter 18, verse 13. And here's what it says. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till eve evening. So Moses' seat was a place where judgment was passed. Listen, we have a question. I want to take that question. Uh, what's, what's the question that we have? Do you have examples of traditions that hold some of us, that some of us hold on to in our churches today that blind us to the truth? All right. Um, if there are, are there traditions that blind us to the truth? Yeah. Yeah, well, there are lots of traditions that we have that blind us to the truth. There are lots of traditions that we have that are not based upon the truth. You know, some of our understanding of how the Holy Spirit works, some of what we assume to be the Spirit comes now from tradition that does not necessarily come from the Lord. Listen, I want you to be able to see in some of our services where people are, are shaking and they're out of control where people are literally falling out and foaming at the mouth, and we look and say, that's the moving of the Spirit. Now, when you begin to see the operation of the Holy Spirit as he operated in through Jesus, right? The, the Spirit of the Lord came down upon him like a dove. that rested upon him in its fullness. The Spirit of the Lord came upon multitudes of people, and we will see that they prophesied. But when you see the foaming at the mouth, when you see I being out of control, when you see breaking chains, it's only in places where people are demonically possessed. So I want you to begin to look at this, though there may be a tradition of being out of control, the ninth fruit of the spirit is temperance, which is self-control. There are places where we tarry for the Holy Spirit. There are places where there are traditions where people are taken into rooms and told, listen, 
Watch my mouth. This is how you'll learn to speak in tongues. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And eventually they start imitating what you say. Well, if it's an unknown tongue that comes from God, it cannot be imitated. It cannot come from man. So there are traditions that we use, that we look at, that hinder us and bind us. There are traditions of baptism, where we literally, where we teach people that you aren't saved without getting in the water. But the reality is salvation if we look at scripture, comes from our confession concerning the Lord Jesus. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. So when you begin to look at that, there are many traditions that bring about guilt, that, that bring about a difficulty, and that literally lead us away from the truth and lead us into fear. So we don't love God out of grace and mercy and gratitude. We love God out of fear. I'm, I, I'm running for, uh, you know, with all I got, you know, because I want to make it in. So the reality is that we begin to develop a works mentality and a works mindset that is completely in opposition to the idea that we don't get there based upon works, but based upon the grace of God. So we, there's multitudes of traditions that we've got to look at. One of the greatest things that we've got to find is what does the word say? If Jesus doesn't say it. Listen, it doesn't mean that the thing may be bad. We have to recognize it's just not gospel. That, that's all that it is. It, 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 there are good things that are happening, you know, in, in the churches that just aren't gospel. That's not gospel. That's you. That may work where you are, that there may be a positive thing even where you are. But anything that's in opposition to the word of God concerning worship is going to be burdensome. So hopefully that answers your question. Now, let's, let's, let's look back here at Moses' seat because we understand that Moses' seat was a place of judgment. And that's, a, that's really important that we understand here exactly what that is. Because when in Deuteronomy 16, when Moses was told, you know, when you enter into the land, I want you to set up judges in the land, right? This is not from the book of judges, but these are people who were going to rule. We, we understand that there are people who sat at gates and they made decisions. So it was a custom here for people in position that was to seat, sit in authorized seats of judgment. They made decisions. So synagogues had these stone places that were like uh, the, the principal's chair or the professor's chair. This is where the teachers were. So the seat of Moses was a specific position in the community that these people hold. They were legitimately positioned leaders. So Jesus is not saying, well, I want you to now just completely uh, just go off the rails and just don't do anything they say. Absolutely not. And listen, that's why we're told now to obey those that have rule over us, whether we like them or not. Because if, if he says, whatever they tell you to do, I want you to do it, right? These positions were often held by ruling elites. They were held by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But Jesus says, I want you to obey them, right? Obey those that have rule over you. They're in a position of rule because the character of of the believer is not one of a lawbreaker, is not one of a rule breaker, right? It's, it's one that is radical and is willing to stand for Christ if that thing does not, if that those words do not come from Moses. But he says, as, as long as what they are teaching comes from the law of God, I don't want you disrespecting them. So he says, whatever they tell you to do, I want you to do it. While they're in Moses' seat, while they're trying the case, Whatever judgment they bring down in Deuteronomy 17, it says all that the judge commands you shall do. Jesus says, I didn't come to break the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. I'm, I'm not. Co I'm coming to fulfill it. So he tells them whatever they require you to do, I want you to do it. But I want you to see this. He because Jesus co totally understands the principles that are going to come out here. The principles that are coming from the seat of Moses, I want you to do. I don't, I don't want you to disobey those things that are written in the word of God, the reverence for God, the reverence for people, the reverence for parents, the reverence for self, the understanding of God's day and the reverence for his day, the reverence for another person's possession and honoring those very same things, honoring one one's good name or even another person's name. So these principles are eternal. They're written down by God. So he says, well, listen, teach this reverence. If they're teaching the reverence for God, if they're teaching the reverence for men, if they're teaching those things that come from Moses, these things are binding 
and they are eternally valid and I want you to do that. So let the doctrine that comes from the word be the rule for your life as far as it, so as far as it agrees with Moses. But here's what he says, but not the works that they do. And, and that's, that's important. He says, I, hear the word, but not the works that they do. Now, you know, Christians oftentimes, you know, hear Pharisees and we, we're used to hearing the Pharisees viewed as hypocrites, right? We, we're used to that. But, and, and so we don't feel threatened in any kind of way when we hear the Pharisees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know those are the bad guys. They get thumbs down. So we feel pretty good when we hear that. But when you understand in modern time, I mean, in, in ancient times, Pharisees were like the popular preachers of the day. Pharisees were people in, who in their contemporary time had people that were devoted to them. They had their own groupies. You know, people would have fought for the Pharisees. And in today's terms, much of this teaching that's geared toward these Pharisees would be geared toward many popular ministers that we fling to and, and heap to ourselves right now. People have huge followings, that, the people that, that everybody knows, people that even secular people who have no connection to anything, anything connected to the kingdom, connected to the church, that, that people would know them. They're so popular. But the reality is Jesus is now coming because they seem to be living holy lives. But the reality is they're practicing human religion. And that's exactly what Jesus is coming from. And he realizes that people can get sucked in. They can become groupies. Listen, the reality is this. Jesus is giving out protection from deception. And that's really important. He's separating the meat from the bones for the children. Listen, I mean, if you understand, I remember when I was a kid. And I remember, you know, when I was really, really young, my mother had to, like when she would make fish. And she would actually have to come over and take the, the, the major bone out of the fish. And then she'd have to watch closely us eating the fish because there were other smaller bones that we couldn't see in the fish. You know, you take that center bone out. And, and where the spine is, you kind of think, I've got it all covered. Jesus now has taken the spine out, but he realizes, yeah, you think because they, they, they look like they got it together. It looks, they look like they're living right. I need to warn you about the bones that you can't see. And the reality is that this is not small. You know, the, you, know when, when you don't recognize that that person who's watching over you has saved your life many a time. You know, I mean, there have been many a time where, you know, I, I, I could have choked. My mother said, watch that. Get that piece right there. That looks good. I see, I see something in it that you can't see. If you're unaware of the bones, you can die. You can choke on those bones. So Jesus now comes and says, listen, conform to their instructions, but not their life. He says they preach, but they do not practice. Do you know how difficult this makes learning when you can't model who you follow? Do you know how difficult it is to have someone, you know, your dad is telling you the right thing, but don't be like him because his life is a mess. Your mother is saying the right thing. So we you know what she said is right. And listen, have you ever watched somebody, you know, drunks can give you great examples. A drunkard can actually tell you not to follow in the, don't you dare do what I did. A drunk can tell you, boy, you better go to college. Don't you go the route I went. And, and they are right, yet you can cannot possibly walk in their shoes because they are living deplorable, broken lives while ministering to you about living wholeness. And so that, that, that happens when you begin to see that. So this is why Jesus says, no, no, no. When you all go out, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. That's what he said. He said it has to exceed the righteous, righteousness of the Pharisees. When I send ministers out, you've got to be in a place where people can follow you, where you can be an example, where they're not just going to do as you say and not as you do. Now, anybody, again, anyone have any questions that you have, once again, don't can, don't don't hesitate because I want to make sure you get the, you get your questions answered. But I want you to understand that Jesus is now dealing with the people that really talk good talk. They, they, they talk the right talk, but they did not practice the things that they ministered themselves. Listen, there are people out here that can preach the paint off the wall, but don't have a life that, that anyone can actually imitate. You know, Jesus said this and Paul would later say, you know, be, be imitators of me. Paul said, follow me 
as I follow Christ. There are people who will literally tell you, if they're really honest, listen to me on Sunday, but don't do anything I do any day other than that. Listen, if you come to my Bible study, I'm going to break this word down because I have the gift of preaching. I have the gift of teaching. And these gifts come without repentance. So I can break this word down in, in Greek and, and Hebrew and Chaldean, whatever you need. But listen, don't follow me out of this church because if you follow me out of this church, you are going to be dramatically disappointed. Listen, don't check me out on Saturday night because if you ever ever see me on Saturday night, you would never talk to me again. So just meet me on Sunday morning in the pulpit with my robe on and that you can follow. Just meet me at Bible study when I sound like a biblical scholar and that you can follow. But my life, there's nothing about me that you could possibly imitate. As a matter of fact, don't imitate me. I don't want to be an example. Jesus is now calling for people who are volunteering for him to use them so that they can be an example. The Pharisees were a horrible example because they expected more of the of others than they expected of themselves. Listen, we're gonna close out here. This is our last verse that we're gonna get to in this particular area of the study. And I, and I wanna make sure we get this. Here's what he says. He, Jesus says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them one finger. And I want you to get this. Jesus is, is, is not talking about the, the, the rites and the ceremonies of Moses. But I want you to understand that over time, the Pharisees begin to develop uh, rites of their own. They, they, the, the kosher laws that you see that many of the Jews observe today. You know, you can eat with this on this plate, but not this on this plate. These things cannot come together. So he now is talking about the tradition of the elders. You know, one of the ways that, one of the things that Jesus came and he said, he said, you know, you've taken your laws and the laws of men, the traditions of men and made the commandments of God of no effect. That the reality is you come in and circumvent it and you don't realize by adding that you've adding, added burdens to people. That, that the reality is that Jesus says, well, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. One of the reasons why he absolutely hated this was that there was never an intention that when Jesus comes on the scene, that he is going to now lift the burdens off the people's shoulders that God placed on there. No way. No, no way. He never placed those burdens there in the first place. Jesus is now coming, having to lift the burden that representatives of God had placed there. What a shame. And listen, I want you to understand that's exactly what's happening even right now. That is Jesus is sending out ministers to minister liberty, to minister freedom, to minister real good news, to minister the gospel. Much of that work is going to go out and it's going to reach people who've never been touched. But you know what? Some of that work, and I would imagine a good amount of that work in this season right now is lifting the chains off of people that are called by the name of the Lord. That, I mean, that literally are Christians, are believers, and yet are walking around clinking and clanging because they have the bondage of religion and not the relationship of Christ. That they have the bondage of rituals and, and, and ceremonies and they understand those things, but they have no knowledge of the spirit of the law. That the Lord said, I came that you would have life and that more abundantly. These people were burden givers. They, they, they came and they placed burdens upon people. Jesus was a burden taker. He came and he lifted the burdens. He says, listen, come to me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Know this. The crazy thing is that you've got an adversary out there who is trying to place false burdens on your shoulders. Isn't it amazing that Jesus isn't even dealing with them? They're going to fall off at the cross. Here's what Jesus is dealing with. He's dealing with burdens that people allow to be placed upon their shoulders. Listen, the burdens that Satan put on people, they may not have been aware of, but this over time becomes self-imposed where people bow their shoulders and say, yep, that's religion, put it on me. You know, isn't it a shame that when we look at the gospel, there's so many people that teach the gospel from such a rules and regulation standpoint that you walk out of there thinking that the gospel is really just about handling your burden, handling the heavy weight, not realizing that we have weight that we can shift over to God. 
So when you begin to look at this, th that when you we teach this way, and Jesus is now coming and rejecting legalism, and that's what we've got to reject here in, in the same exact way. He's insisting on obedience to the Mosaic law, but not the Mosaic law as a foundation for Christian life. That when Jesus comes, he even comes against the law. He comes and says, listen, I've come and, and I've come not to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. So when I say coming against the law, directly after the fulfillment, he says, that's done. Being a believer is not fulfilling these laws. Peter tells the legalist in Acts 15, 10, he says, why do you test God? By putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. We could not bear it. That's why Jesus has come. So the whole outlook is, 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 is when you begin to look at this, is that there are thousands upon thousands of people that are bearing these intolerable burdens right now. And when you begin to look at faith, when you begin to look at it, you got to ask yourself, does it lift your wings? Does it really make you fly? Or is it, is it a weight that just drags you down? Does it bring joy into your life? Or does it bring depression? Does it cultivate th those very same things? And listen, when your faith, when your religion becomes depressing and burdensome and all about prohibition, it's no longer true religion. And I want you to know that. And, and the reality is that Jesus says, I want you to be able to see how these Pharisees operate. They had the power to lift. These were human burdens and they could lift them. You know, one of the things about a burden that, that and the Lord would sometimes allow it to bear, to allow you to bear, to let you see what the people, who the people are around you. And one of the things that Jesus says was, I see these people with these burdens and you see these people with these burdens, but yet you don't lift one finger to make their lives easier. You don't lift one finger to remove some of these things. You don't relax any of your regulations and your little laws. So when you begin to look at this, when religion becomes a burden, I want you to understand it's no longer religion. Check yourself today. Check what's going on around you. Check how you present the gospel and make sure we're presenting what is good news. Listen, the believer doesn't is, is not one that's, you know, I per permit anything. You know, we just go for anything. You know, God is not through with me yet. You know, that's not the mantra. The mantra, the reality is the ministry, the wording, the faith that we have is that we serve a God who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything we can ask or think. And that the offer of this great grace is open to all that desire it. So be lifted today. You know, in, in this Bible study, my hope is that you'll walk away from this. You know, this is not necessarily a breakdown of the church. This is not some great criticism, you know, of the church. But this is a the same consternation, the same denunciation of those that came to put a burden upon people and, and, and call it godly. Uh, it's the same denunciation 2,000 years ago that was happening that's happening right now. We denounce that. We come against that. And my prayer today is that you will walk in freedom, that we were not talking about debauchery. We're not talking about the freedom to do whatever your flesh wants to do, but we're talking about the freedom to be who God has called you to be. We're talking about the freedom to worship him in spirit and in truth. We're talking about the, the freedom to really fly. And when you find out that the rules and the regulations are gone and that all that the Lord requires is that you love him with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that you love your neighbors yourself, you'll find out that, wow, these, these, this burdensome rule, this, this hard place that I thought, the thing that was keeping me from coming to church and being a part of this, because I'm not ready yet, because you know, I don't have myself together. When you understand that even that, he doesn't require you to get yourself together. He says, come to me and I'll get you together. That's the good news. And the burden that some of you have been feeling has been become, become because of tradition, things that you had heard. But I want you to understand something. You don't ask God anything. You don't, you don't come to God and, and question anything. That's a lie. That's part of the tradition that we've learned. But the Lord said, listen, if any man lack wisdom, that means a person who's got some questions about some things, let him ask him God. Who will, uh, who will give it to you liberally and upbraid not. That the Lord is asking you to come boldly before the throne, asking what you will. Come today with this mindset 
God, you know, what's keeping me away from you may have been barriers that I put up. The things that are keeping me away from you that may have been barriers that other people put up. But you know what? You've told me to break down the walls. And today, my this evening, my prayer is that you'll get aggressive and break down those walls, whether those are walls of tradition, whether those walls are religion, whatever those walls are, so that you'll do whatever it takes to get to Jesus and not to people. Let's get delivered from people today so we can worship God. Listen, my hope is that you enjoyed this Bible study. We didn't get a lot of questions tonight, so we're going to continue this so we can we can continue to get more questions. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if there's any other questions that you guys have, but but we're going to close out our Bible study here. If, you know, if anybody has a quick question, I'll certainly take take that. And if anybody has any questions that you want to take offline, certainly don't hesitate to let me know. But I my hope is that you really understand what this Bible study really is all about. And so that we can walk in liberty and we can re reproduce in other people. Children of God that also walk in the very same liberty that we walk in. Listen, my hope is that you'll share this video. This has been a blessing to you. Please let somebody know about this. You know, I want to challenge you this week as you go out to witness to someone. Tell somebody about the goodness of Jesus. Listen, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our time. And if there's ever a time when the good news was needed, look at your news and check it out. It's not right now. If there was ever a time when there was a need for a torchbearer, it is now. And if there was ever a time for a light to shine in the midst of darkness, it is now. My hope is that you were blessed by this Bible study. And if you're led to sow into this ministry, do not hesitate. We appreciate your support. And if you want to see something really great, I'm, my, my prayer is this. Go to disciplesoffaith.life to check out our website because you're going to be blessed in so many ways. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome Thursday.